Michael Burry, who made a fortune betting on the housing crash, just made a $1.6 billion bet that the stock market is going to crash very soon. Let's go straight to the whiteboard, and I'm going to reveal how he is placing this bet. And we're going to come back and go through why he is most likely placing this bet and how you can protect yourself or maybe even profit from a stock market crash. This is a chart of the S&P 500. It goes all the way back to 2019 to today's date. On the left, we go from 2,400 up to 4,800. And as you can see, since 2019, it has gone up, peaked out in 2021, then goes down. So right now, we are right around 4,500 on the S&P 500. Michael Burry, right there, obviously, he's got his headphones in, he's got his drumsticks, he's listening to Slayer, most likely, <laughs> and he is betting that the stock market is going to do this, go straight down, and or volatility is going to skyrocket. So how's he doing this? Well, he's buying options. So basically buying puts, which means he has the right to sell shares of an ETF at a certain price. So basically he bought a contract stating that he could sell $886 million worth of SPDR, which is basically an ETF trust for the S&P 500, at a certain date, at a certain strike price. Then also with the NASDAQ QQQ, the NASDAQ 100, he is placing this $739 million bet, so about $1.6 billion in total. Well, keep in mind, he's just buying the right through a contract to be able to sell $1.6 billion in shares at a certain date if they get to a specific price. So he's not paying $1.6 billion. It's not like he's taking $1.6 billion out of his pocket and placing a specific bet. So let's just say that buying the right to sell these shares at a certain price at a certain date cost him $100 million. Okay, from there, what he's got to do, he's got to figure out what date. So let's just say January 1st of 2024 and at what price. Let's say for the sake of ease that each one of these shares are selling for $1.50 right now as we speak. So what he does, he say, okay, on January 1st, that's my expiration date, I am betting that they will be less than $1. So what happens is as the market goes down, the options that he purchased, that contract, the value goes up. Same thing with the volatility represented by these green arrows. But time is a different matter. They call this time decay. So as the expiration date gets closer and closer and closer, the value of those options goes down, assuming that you're not already at the strike price. And again, in this example, we're assuming that strike price was $1. So the price of options seems very complex, but in reality, it's pretty simple. Just ask yourself the question, is the probability that the share gets down to my price increasing or decreasing? Right here. <laughs> so this is you. And when you buy the option, you have no emotion whatsoever. But as the probability goes higher that your options are in the money, by the time that expiration date occurs, then you're going to be a happy investor because the value of your options are increasing. But if the probability is going down, then the value is decreasing, then you're most likely pretty pissed off. So again, what determines the probability? That would be the direction of the stock market, the volatility, and the time decay, or how close we are to the actual expiration date that you, or in this case, Michael Burry, chose. So why is Michael Burry making this $1.6 billion bet? Well, I don't know the guy, and I can't get into his head, but I assume he's looking at the exact same data that we talk about on this channel constantly, such as the inversion of the yield curve. So let's check it out. Right now, the two-year treasury is trading the yield is trading 77 basis points higher than the 10-year. And as you can see, when this curve inverts, this almost always predicts a recession. In fact, going all the way back to 1950, we have never had a recession without an inversion of the yield curve. 
and the yield curve only inverted once without a recession, and that was in the mid-1960s when GDP growth slowed considerably. So it's batting almost a 1,000 right now. But Michael Burry also realizes that most of the time, and you can tell from this chart going back to 1980, the recession occurs after the yield curve is no longer inverted. So he's most likely predicting that the Fed is going to drop rates because of some sort of crisis situation very soon. And once they do, that's going to be the start of the official recession. And usually that's when the stock market goes down the most. Let's go over to this next chart, my good buddy, Jesse Felder, and he posted this on Twitter a few weeks ago. And this is absolutely fascinating. We have the average move of each asset for recessions going back to 1973. So this gold line represents the S&P 500. And starting at negative 150, and then we go to positive 135, this is the days around the recession. So this dotted line in the middle is when the official recession starts. And keep in mind, the central planners always announce this looking through the rear view mirror. They never announce it in real time. It's always like six or nine months later. They say, oh, yeah, by the way, <laughs> that recession that we're in right now, that started six or nine months ago. So whenever the official date is 150 days prior, usually the stock market goes up and up and up and up and up. So we get to about 36 days before, then it starts to go down. But you can see the majority of the decline is after the recession officially starts. Again, this is usually after the yield curve is no longer inverted as a result of the Fed dropping rates and that two-year treasury going back down below the 10-year. But you guys have been hearing about this for the last year, at least, if you've been watching my channel. There's other things that nobody is talking about that is most likely on Michael Burry's radar. Let's check it out. Go right over to the New York Times, and we can see that the Eurozone is in recession right now as we speak. In fact, in Q4 of 2022 and Q1 of 2023, they had negative GDP, so technical recession, and they have not yet come out of it. But it's not just Europe when you look around the world. Also, China. Big news and red flags coming out of China. What I'm referring to specifically is the fact that the Chinese central bank has lowered interest rates twice through these emergency meetings. No one was expecting it. And all of a sudden they came out and dropped rates. And they stated they were doing this because of these emergency situations. What would be considered an emergency situation? Well, most of you have heard about Evergrande. We were talking about that last year. It was a huge real estate company that was going bust in China. And you have to remember that real estate, the industry, is a large percentage of their overall GDP. So if real estate is crashing in China, that means the entire economy is likely coming down with it. But now we fast forward a year to where we are today, and it's gotten a lot worse. The biggest real estate company in all of China is called Country Garden. And now they are having the exact same problems that Evergrande had about a year ago. Oh, but wait, there is more when it comes to China. We're talking about the real estate market crashing and this bringing down their economy, but their manufacturing base is suffering as well. Check out this recent report from the New York Times where China is suspending they're reporting on youth unemployment. So check out this chart. Their youth unemployment has gone from just below 12% in 2018, and it's skyrocketed all the way up to 21.3%. And this is the age range from 16 to 24. So at this all-time high, it's getting so bad that now China is basically throwing in the towel and saying, we're not even going to report this number anymore. That's how bad the unemployment picture, it, or that's how bad the employment picture is in China right now. Okay, well, let's think this through. If their job market is suffering right now, and this is indicated by youth unemployment being at an all-time high, this likely means that their manufacturing is suffering as well. Well, if their manufacturers aren't doing well, then this would imply they're getting fewer orders. Well, who does China make all the stuff for? 
That would be the rest of the global economy, more specifically, the United States. So who makes the stuff that you buy at Home Depot, at Lowe's, at Walmart, at Target? It's most likely all of these Chinese companies that are laying off workers or not hiring youth workers in China, and that's why the unemployment rate is so high. So the fact that the Chinese manufacturing part of the economy is doing poorly right now would imply that the United States economy is doing poorly as well because we're not buying as much as we used to buy from the people who are producing it. But although I'm sure Michael Burry is paying attention to the yield curve, to what's going on in Europe, to what's going on in China, he's also focused on what's going on with the U.S. banking system. Fitch Reporting Agency just came out and said that they'll likely have to downgrade more than 70 U.S. banks. And it isn't just the small community banks or the regional banks. This includes banks like J.P. Morgan. So you may be asking yourself, okay, George, well, what's the big deal? So what, they have to downgrade the banks? Yes, I know all about this commercial real estate. It's a big problem. This is old news. But there's more to the story. If they downgrade J.P. Morgan, they're likely going to downgrade all the other banks that are below them. Now, a lot of these banks right now are just on the cusp of investment grade and non-investment grade. So that's a big deal because a lot of these huge pools of money out there, these pension funds, as an example, they can only invest in investment grade debt from these banks. So let's say you've got 100 banks that are right on the cusp and they go from triple B, I think it is, down to the next tier. All those pools of money are going to be forced to sell those bonds which means when they have to borrow again, these banks that get downgraded from investment grade down to the next tier, then their interest rate is going to go through the roof. The interest rate that they're paying to borrow money. And that takes you right back into a situation or that puts them into the same type of situation that Silicon Valley Bank was in, Signature and First Republic when they went bust. Let me be very clear, Fitch hasn't yet downgraded these banks, but they're saying that the probability and the risks are very high that they will be downgraded in the near future. And this could be the black swan event, that by definition, nobody sees except for maybe Michael Burry, which is why, among all the other reasons that we've discussed today, and I'm sure many that we haven't discussed, he placed that $1.6 billion bet that the stock market would crash very near future. So what can you do to protect yourself? Or maybe what can you do to actually profit from a stock market crash if you have a similar view to Michael Burry? Well, I can't give you any investment advice, but I can tell you what I'm doing in my own portfolio. And that's I'm loading up on cash. It's very risk off. Right now, I'm pretty much strictly in physical gold and very short-term T-bills getting paid 5.5%, waiting for things that I want to buy to go down in price, to become cheap. So then I can go ahead and sell those treasuries. I can take that cash and buy the hard assets like commodities that I want to hold for the long term, but buy them at a much cheaper price. But unfortunately, a stock market crash isn't the only thing that we have to worry about right now. In fact, I think an even bigger problem is a central bank digital currency. And to find out more about how the Federal Reserve or maybe the BIS will implement a global CBDC, check out this video right below.